Uh, Mark chapter 13, we're going to look at something that's uh, uh, really an observation uh, in the day in which we live that I believe in a lot of ways turning a blind eye to. And because of that, it's had an effect on the church as a whole, I believe, uh, for the cause of Christ. I mean, it really has. So in, in Mark chapter 13, I want to start reading in verse 33. The Bible says, uh, Take ye heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants, and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning. Lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all. So that tells me he left nobody out. He said unto all, he said, watch. Now, the, the context of this, right? Jesus Christ is coming soon. Now, we don't know when that is. But there's no question that he's coming. Right? Uh, he is, as a man taking a far journey, who will return at some point in the future. In the context of this, we're His servants. And He's given us authority until His return. But it is not only an authority, but it's a responsibility. He gave them something to do. He said, here it is, this is for you. I'm going away, I'm coming back. But until I come back, this is what I want done. There are tasks to be performed according to His plan that He left us when He departed. Now, in the Bible, we see some of those actually given. Jesus gave some, some specific things. He told Peter in John 21, feed the sheep. Now, that was specific. In uh, Luke 24, He told His disciples, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in His name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. That was, that was his, his orders that He gave, the command that He gave, and then He left. In Mark 16, Jesus told them, And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Now, we've, we've heard this a lot recently. The Great Commission is, a, is an announcement by God to His people, I'm leaving, and I'm leaving this for you to do. I'm giving you the authority to do it. I'll give you the power to do it. But it needs to be done. He said, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And then he said, Amen. Let it be. Let it be so. All right, now, in Acts chapter 1, he, he also gave uh, instruction. He said, But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Now understand that the context of Mark chapter 13 is Jesus is leaving, and He's leaving us a responsibility. And all of these things are actually talking about that responsibility. It said uh, uh, in uh, Luke 19, uh, verse 13, And he called his ten servants and, de and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So all of this fits together. I'm leaving, but I'm coming back. But I'm leaving you something to do until I come back. Occupy. The word is defined as busying oneself with a given task to be profitable in a trade. We're supposed to be profitable servants. We're supposed to be accomplishing something for our master, for our God. So I want you to occupy. It doesn't mean occupy space. 
literally means to occupy a task. And that's what we need to do. We're given a story to illustrate our responsibility while the master is away. If you take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 25, I want you to read this with me. Matthew chapter 25 and verse 14. The Bible says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country. Now understand that the gospel, different gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, when you put them all together, they give you a completed picture. You get more detail sometimes from one gospel than you would another. Uh, he said, goes into a far country, who called his own servants, and delivered unto them his goods. Well, he's left us what we need. It's what he's telling us. And under, uh, under one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. They saw him. He ascended back into heaven. And he gave us what we needed to be profitable, to occupy. All right? Uh, verse 16. Then he, uh, I mean, verse 15. And under one he gave five talents unto another two, another one, to every man according to his several ability. We're not all the same. But he did say he gave this charge to all. Okay? Then likewise, he had, uh, he had received two, he gained two, and the one that got uh, given five, he gained five. Verse 18, so, but he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. What would you do with it? Reckoning day is coming because he's coming back. And we'll give an account. If he gave you five, what would you do with the five? If he gave you two, what would you do with the two? If he gave you one, what would you do with it? You say, well, I didn't lose it. But that's not what he gave it to us for. Remember, he gave it to us to occupy, to be profitable in the trade that he's giving us of, what he's, of, the, of the equipment and the empowering and all that that he's given us. All right, now, that's the context. The concern... In, in Mark chapter 13, it's found in verse 36. He said, the concern is, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. That's his concern. Well, let's just be honest. It is profitable to sleep for rest. But that about covers it. It's not profitable in the things that God's given us to do to be sleeping. So his concern is, when I return, will I find you sleeping? If you're sleeping, there's a lack of urgency to what's going on. Uh, there's a lack of diligence if you're sleeping. There are things slipping through while we're sleeping. We'll get to that the, uh, next time. The idea of things that are slipping. It's a very legitimate concern. Will I find you sleeping when I come? The concern is a casual approach to our responsibility has allowed the enemy to gain a foothold in places that it should have never happened. Don't think for a minute that the devil can't get a stronghold in the church. Especially if we're asleep. Now, we have the context and the concern. Now let's have the command. In verse 37, Mark chapter 13, the command is to watch. Interesting word. The pastor and I were talking about it before service. This is the Word of God. You want to find out what the Word of God means? Find out what the words in the Word of God means. Study them. And what God does, God gives the ultimate of a definition. In other words, man can only take a definition so far, God can take it to infinity. infinity. And when we look at the word watch, and then we find out that in that command it was delivered to all, not just leaders, not just staff, not just, as I've heard it say, professionals. That's kind of scary, I think. 
uh, not just the young and not just the old. It's given to all. Because all, if you're saved, you're His servant. Right. And He's left you and me with that responsibility. All right, now, what about the clarification? I need to find out. If I'm supposed to watch, I need to find out what that means. Here's the clarification. Watch means to keep awake. It means to be vigilant. To be watchful like a guard or a sentinel standing at his post. The word means to be attentive. To look with attention or steadiness, close observation and scrutiny. It means to keep guard. Vigilance for keeping or protecting against danger. Wow. To look with expectation. Be vigilant in preparation for an event or trial, the time of whose arrival is uncertain. We don't know when he's coming. It's interesting. Will he find us sleeping when he comes? Another passage says, when he comes, will he find faith? But he's coming. As we used to say when we were a kid, ready or not, you know, he's coming. He's coming. The day's coming. Uh, it means to watch. The word watch is to watch is to be fully aware of one's responsibility and to be sure that they're carried out in full compliance. In other words, whatever God said, do, do. That's it. And if you're not going to do that, you're not watching. I looked at uh I always thought it was interesting to see some positives and negatives. The, the positive of this, the synonyms, means to look at, to survey, to examine, to scrutinize, to inspect, to look after, to be mindful of, to guard, to beware, to consider, to keep an eye on, to watch over, to take care of, to attend to, to pay attention to, to be cautious about. <gasps> That's watching. Can you find anywhere in all of that that anything about watching is casual. So we have to combat that. We have to combat casualness. If, if any old way is okay, then we're not watching. Nothing about the definition says any old way is okay. God's very specific about it. But if that's a synonym, what's the antonym? What's the opposite of watching? Ignore neglect, to show a lack of concern, urgency, or priority. It literally means just to be casual. Just going through the motions. If we, if we do not combat that, and by the way, in many ways, we have not combated that. And as a result of that, there are things that's going on right now that carry the name of Jesus with them has nothing to do with Jesus. Right, right, right. But something about that has become accepted as representing Jesus when it's not. Right. There needs to be the real, yeah. not the counterfeit. Yeah. Amen. We've got to confront this casualness. So, Within the context and the concern and the command, is there really a problem? Well, there is. It's a crisis. There's a crisis of our day, and this is it. We have a tendency to look at the woes of the world without looking at the woes of the church. We can very easily do this, by the way. Point the finger and say, look how bad that is. And we can be correct in that. I'm not saying we're not. Because the world's in a mess. The world's crazy. As I, I think it was Vance Habner made the statement years ago. He said, one day, uh, uh, the world will become an insane asylum run by the inmates. That's where we are. But we're so busy looking at that, 
that we're not watching. Because our responsibility, Pastor said it a while ago, just, just very clearly, if you, if you listen, our responsibility is not to fix them. Only God can do that. Our responsibility ability is to occupy until he, we come. Until he comes. We need to occupy. I'm going to tell you why I'm a little bit uh, more so than normal, I guess. I'm a little bit nervous tonight. Because leading up to this, I just knew how, I just knew how important this is. And that I was given the responsibility to say it. And it just kind of overwhelms me. Because this is a good church. I mean, it really is. And there are people that watch this, and, and they're good people, and they're in good churches. But you start holding this up as the standard and look at it and we begin to tarnish a little bit. We really do. Especially when we become so accustomed to watered down Christianity. Because it's, it's rampant everywhere. And you know that. So the crisis is uh, we have a tendency to look in the wrong direction. First Peter four seventeen says this: For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Oh, I thought it ought to judgment ought to fall on the White House first. It should, don't you think so? No, that's not what God said. Judgment's first at the house of God. And if it first begin at us. What shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Well, I get that. understand that. If God's dealing with his own people, and we need to be chastised, and we do, then he say, well, what's it going to be like for those that don't even claim to know God at all? And, and you know, Well, it's going to be bad. But we need to look here instead of there. Confronting casualness. What do we find as a crisis in the church? Casualness, procrastination, wrong priorities, unconcern, comfort, being at ease, satisfaction with the status quo. Complacency. You remember a message preached just before the revival? That's to preach lukewarmness. That's a crisis. Laziness. Lack of motivation. No initiative. And this is the one that kind of got to me as I was studying it out. Detachment. In other words... Not my problem, not my responsibility, not my job. Detachment. That's, somebody, that's for somebody else. Uh, I'm going to date myself now. There was a, a TV show on many years ago called Chico and the Man. Freddie Prinze was one of the actors in that. He had a, a catchphrase. He said, not my job, man. It's not my job. It's, and that was a long time ago. So it's, it's amazing to me that they're still talking like that. The church talks like that. It's not my job. Not my responsibility. Somebody else. Not me. Hey, remember, the Bible's always right. He said he gave those orders to all. Now, is everybody supposed to do everything? No, no. God's very specific about things. Remember, he gave five and two and one, and 
according to several ability. I mean, he, he dishes it out that way, but he dished it to all. Right. Amen. And said, you have a responsibility in that. Occupy till I come. Sometimes our problem is a lack of confidence as to why we don't do what we should do. Now, some people call that low self-esteem. All right, let me deal with that a little bit. This is what the Bible says. The Bible says that we should not think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Right, that's Romans chapter 12 and verse 3. But, which is also a great word in the Bible. But, if you are a child of God, you should not think less of yourself than you ought to think. I mean, you're different now. You have the Holy Spirit of God living in you. You have the power to do what God wants you to do. God's not going to tell you to go take what I've given you and, and be profitable with it if you can't take it and be profitable with it. I mean... We've been given the power of God to do God's will. Right. Don't say you can't. Right. Uh, we're without excuse. He said watch. So we can. Yes. We can do what he wants us to do. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He hasn't changed his mind. Right. He said, I want you to do this till I come. All right, let's check it out right now. Is there anybody in here that's gone up in the rapture yet? Then he hasn't come yet for us. So what he said still applies to us right now. He knew when it was going to be. And he said, I want you to occupy till I come. Not yet. He hadn't been. He's not come yet. But he is coming. He wants us to occupy. He wants us to do what he wants us to do. He wants us to watch. Opinions and fears do not dictate change to God's plan. He said, watch. And that's what he meant. I've told this story many times. I was my, kind of an unusual situation, I was my father's and mother's pastor and I was their Sunday school teacher before I was their pastor and my dad had a problem with a Bible doctrine he said I just have a hard time believing that once I'm saved I can just do something terrible and still go to heaven he said, I just, he had a hard time getting that in his head. So one Sunday morning in Sunday school, I'm teaching through Romans. And I said, the Bible says that those that he saved, he justified. Those that he justified, he sanctified. Those that he sanctified, he glorified now you look at it very clearly and it it says it's already done now I'm not in glory yet but I'm already glorified in God now I asked the question that morning now either that means what it says or it doesn't neither God meant what he said or he didn't now you tell me which it is God's told us to occupy till I come. That's what he meant. That's what he said. And he hasn't changed his mind. Right. Amen. And I worked with my dad back then. We, he had a car lot for years, and I was working with him, rebuilding cars and stuff and doing stuff. And uh, uh, he just walked by me one day and just looked at me. That's kind of the way he was. He just looked at me and he said, he meant what he said. And he walked off. And I didn't know what he was talking about <laughs> until I asked him. He said, oh, you know what you said in Sunday school? He meant what he said. He, but he had a hard time with that. Well, but God meant what he said. Right. Right. And he's going to do everything he said he's going to do. And he wants us to do what he's told us he wants us to do. He wants us to watch. Right. 
That's what he meant. So, the crisis is, maybe we're not watching till Jesus comes like we should. The proof of this. Now, I know we're not in Missouri, we're in Kentucky, but some people, you just have to show them. The show me state. I come from Virginia. I, I think that's the hard-headed state or something. I don't know. But, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to convince somebody of some things. But the proof of this is found in the present-day lack of influence on the world that the church once had. Now, think about that. Does the church have the influence in the world any longer like it did at one time? Oh, so God's no longer God? His power is no longer as powerful as it once was? Or, oh, the world's more wicked. Well, it may be. The devil's no stronger. The devil's no smarter. We may be dumber. I don't know. But we don't have the influence. The church doesn't have the influence it once had. Preacher Gregory told me one time, he said, when I first started, in, he said, when I first started in the ministry, I'd go to somebody's house and talk to them, and if they were, you know, drinking a beer or something, they would hide it behind their back while they were talking to me. He said, now they offer me one. <laughs> something, something happened along the way. Well, maybe we fell asleep. Maybe we became casual. Maybe we were not quite as urgent as we once were. All right. Uh, there was a time when the church turned the world upside down. And the world and the devil hated it, but the influence was real nevertheless. To say that it's just the days we're living in is to say that God has somehow diminished in power and His Word is no longer effectual or relevant for us today he told us to watch until he comes and that must refer to our present day because he has not come yet all right now here's some corresponding verses again I just when you uh when you're reading your bible and studying your bible get you a dictionary be sober, the Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The word vigilant is exactly the same Greek word as the word watch. So all of those definitions that we had for watch is the same definition here of being vigilant. Because you must be vigilant because that roaring lion is there to destroy you. Now, we're not quite there in the study yet, but when we get to the den of lions, you better be vigilant or you're going to be supper. You say, oh, no, didn't you, you make it sound like it's all on me. No, 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 no. It's not, all, it's not, it's not on me at all, really. To overpower the lion. It's my responsibility to put faith in the one that can. And that faith, by the way, there's nothing about faith that's casual. I think back over all the, the men I've heard preach over the years, and one message I remember Brother Gregory bringing in church one night. He said, I know that some people think that faith is of a particular persuasion, like a noun. He said, but no, it's a verb. He said, he said think of it this way. We're supposed to be faithing. In other words, it's act, active. It's put in action. Faithing. If you're asleep, you're not faithing. If you're not watching, you're not faithing. You've, you've stepped off your post and said, well, this really isn't all that important. I'm not really sure the devil sleeps. 
And if he does, he's got plenty of help, then it seems like he never sleeps. I do know the Bible says God never sleeps. He says, be vigilant to be watchful. And then all of a sudden I get this other word, one of my favorites, circumspect. We don't use that one very often in modern day English, do we? Circumspect. To watch, to be vigilant, to be circumspect, to be attentive, to, dis to discover and to avoid danger or to provide for safety. What do you think Daniel did? And I think the Bible says the den of lions. Isn't that correct? You know, okay. That's different than a lion's den. Well, it is. Because a lion's den doesn't necessarily have to have lions in it. But a den of lions, that's different. If I was in a lion's den and there were no lions there, I wouldn't be too worried. But I'm going to be concerned if when I'm thrown in, a, in that area where there's a den of lions, then I better be sober. I better be vigilant. I better be watching. I better be faithing. So you think Daniel, when he was thrown into that den of lions, do you think he stopped praying then? I mean, that's why he was thrown in there. Is, is now the time to stop? Is now the time to fall asleep? Don't think so. He would have been vigilant in that situation, which we should as well. By the way, we live in a den of lions. I don't know if you ever thought of it this way or not, but you and I both live behind enemy lines. The Bible says that the devil's the god of this world. Now, that doesn't mean he's more powerful than, than God, but he is the god of this world. We're living on his ground, his territory. This is his jurisdiction. God's allowed that. We're living behind enemy lines. Do you think if we were at war, and by the way, we are, and since we're at war, are we supposed to be asleep? Are, are we supposed to be casual? It's going to be okay? No. Nothing about what the Bible teaches on this subject is halfway. Nothing. To be circumspect, to be attentive. To be vigilant is to combat the tendency to be casual or neglectful. It is a detailed exactness of life. That's what circumspect literally means. It means to be so careful in what you do. Because since we're in the devil's territory, I'm telling you, there are landmines everywhere. The Bible uses the term snares. They are everywhere. And if you're not vigilant, if you're not watching, if you're not attentive, if you're not circumspect, you're going to find yourself in a snare. If I knew that there was a, a, a field of landmines out here, I'm not going to go skipping through the field. I'm going to heaven, so I'm just going to skip through the field. Well, you're going to get there quicker, I guess. That's what God wants us to do. In Ephesians chapter 5, in verse 14, the Bible says this, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. You already have life. He'll give you light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Well, the Bible says the fool that said in his heart there is no God. So if we're walking as fools, we're walking as people that don't believe there's a God. That's not circumspect, that's foolishness. And he says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Well, what time is it he's referring to? The time of his return. Redeeming the time until he comes back. And he is coming. Circumspectly means a careful exactness. I 
I've uh, been accused of looking like Robert E. Lee. I'll give you a Robert E. Lee quote. He made the statement. He said, you do what's right. Let God work out the details. That's circumspect. That's being careful. That's watching and uh, walking and watching in such a way that you know there's problems out there and you know that that lion hates you and wants to devour you. That's his, the, the very existence of the devil is to beat you and me. He hates you. I don't care what he told you. He's a liar. He hates you. Hates your family. And wants to destroy it. You better watch. You better be on guard. You better have your eyes open. You better be attentive. You better pay attention to the details. You better be careful. Don't be casual. Circumspectly means to be exact. To be circumspect, uh, circumspect is to pay attention to the details. It's to be aware of your surroundings and to be alert to the possibilities of potholes, booby traps, roadblocks, snares, and landmines. In other words, to be circumspect is to be fully attentive to the devices and wiles of the devil and to the allures of the flesh and the world. It is our natural nature, not our new nature, our natural nature to gravitate to something that's easier, less stressful not so much work to it I didn't work to get saved isn't that great you didn't either but what about the work after you're saved am I working to get to heaven no I'm working because I'm going to heaven there needs to be that circumspect aspect to our life here in this world. We are behind enemy territory. You guys that were in the military, if you ever found yourself behind enemy lines, <clears throat> you didn't think sleeping was a good idea. But I'm afraid we've fallen asleep in a lot of ways. To be circumspect is to be very leery. Now, now, now I'm meddling. You ready? I'm going to meddle. To be circumspect is to be very leery of tolerating and changing that which has been established, such as following the latest religious trends and fads. We must be aware of false doctrine and false precepts of religion we must be circumspect I know the Bible is very clear about this it talks about straight is the way few that find it but if you look out most of the world that you and I are familiar with, which is the world around us, I mean, we don't know too much about things going on all around the world, but kind of in America, you know what we've kind of been fooled into? Everybody's all right. I mean, we are Americans anyway. I mean, you know that. So We've got to be all right. We're not being circumspect. Everybody that calls themselves a preacher is not a preacher. Everybody that claims they have the truth doesn't have the truth. And everybody that declares it is not necessarily declaring it. But it's okay. One of the most famous lines in religious circles that I've heard in my lifetime. When I was growing up as a kid, I heard this on the television. And this coming Sunday, go to the church of your choice. You ever heard that? I wonder what part of the Bible they got that out of. 
Because what I found out that if we go to the church of our choice, we go to the one that we choose because it lines up with what we believe. You see, if you want to go to the right kind of church, go to a church that believes what God believes. That'd be a good choice. I found out a lot of things along the way. One of them was this, that it was a whole lot better for God to show me a wife than for me to pick out one. That's worked out real well. Nancy and I walked into a store this afternoon. She was shipping something back that didn't like it or didn't fit. I don't know what it was, but we were sending it back. And we walked in the door, and we were holding hands, and the, and the ladies behind the counter, y'all just so cute. And I said, well, it's worked pretty well for 42 years so far. 42 years. I wonder how long it would have lasted if I picked. I know it would not have been a way, well if she'd have picked. If she'd have been smart, she wouldn't have picked me. But God picked us, but also God knew what he was going to do with us. It's one of my favorite lines, God sees around the corner. We can't do that, but he can. He knows what's coming. He knows where he's going to send you. He knows what he wants to do in your life. He knows what kind of occupying he wants you to occupy. And he knows how to put all that together. I wonder if we're watching. You can't go through this life and live for Jesus and be casual. We have to be intentional. We have to be committed. You can't be indifferent. You can't be relaxed. You can't be apathetic. You can't be nonchalant. You just have to watch. You have to be on guard. Now, I'm meddling again. Humility is submissive to God's will. Humility watches. God said, watch. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Watch. He said to watch. I'm supposed to watch. But you know what pride will do? Pride will not watch. Pride will say, I got it. Pride bucks up against instruction. You want me to prove it to you? I can. All right, here's an example. If I showed you a principle from the Word of God and you agreed with it, this is what you say. Boy, that's right, preacher. But if I showed you a principle out of the Word of God that you disagreed with, you might be looking for another church. Or you might just dismiss me and say, well, you just legalistic, judgmental. Another one of Preacher Gregory's lines. I never wanted to be a dictator. I always wanted to be a sweet tater. But if, if, if listen, what, what, have you, what have you bucked up against? The Word of God. And there are things in the Word of God, and you know this is a fact. We don't like some of them. I mean, they, they really are contrary to the flesh and contrary to our natural way of thinking. But you just dismiss me and say, well, that's just not for me. Then you're not watching. You're being casual about this. Was the problem the Word of God? Was the problem presenting the Word of God? Or your decision to do what you wanted to do regardless of what the Word says? Uh, I think this is pretty much the case. If, if the authority in the military tells you to do something, you're supposed to do it. Are you supposed to question it? I don't think so. Now, 
I'm going to tell you that military uh, authorities can be wrong. God's never been wrong. And if he says this is the way it should be, if you disagree with that, you're disagreeing with what's right. Absolutely right. When we don't watch and become casual, then we'll find ourselves entrenched in our own opinion rather than in the truth. Well, how does that happen? Well, it's very simple. The enemy sneak in while you were asleep. He set up camp. I'm sure the preacher was criticized for this. I was too. When all of a sudden there's this something going on somewhere, you know, in the schools. And it's the next great revival in America. But it did not line up with Scripture. So who was wrong? I was, according to a lot of people, because, I mean, are, are you trying to say God cannot bring revival? Never said that. I've never said that. Now what happened was, those that got caught up in all of that have been asleep. And the enemy came in and camped out and set up a stronghold. And people started listening to religion rather than the Bible. And as a result of that, their casual approach fooled them. Fooled them. So, what we want to do through this is examine ourselves as we study the Bible. We are Baptists, right? I think. Is that right? Okay. Soul authority in faith and practice. The Bible. Baptist distinctive. Are we faithfully carrying out? our duty to watch are we at our post diligently on guard or have we become casual uh, this is in my notes but I'm just going to throw it out right quick just to, just to point out something uh, if walking through those doors into this building is not viewed as being in a different building than any other building on earth. You don't have the right respect for this place. So what are you? Casual. This house of God. Can you imagine somebody in the Old Testament be bopping into the tabernacle or the temple? You know, just, I can come any old way I want to. Come as you are. You know, that, that's, isn't that the trend? Come as, well, you say, but, but are you talking about outward things? Well, I found out outward things had a whole lot to do with inward things. You know, it really does. Uh, the, the only way you ought to ever come to church is with a suit and tie on. I never said that. But I believe the Bible does say something about your best. And that ought to be our approach. And it ought to be a, a, a certain uh, uh, attitude when we walk into this building. The building's not the church, but it's where the church meets. And it's where God should be. And if you didn't get this word the other day, it's where God manifests himself, I believe, differently than he does anywhere else. In his house. That's why the Bible says, this is how you ought to behave yourself in the house of God. Okay. Casual. The casual approach. 
I wonder if we're uh, uh, AWOL. Absent without official leave. I wonder if we are asleep. Uh, have things crept in while we were not at our I guess if I wanted to, I could go do this. I don't know, I suppose. Uh, I was thinking about it the other day. If I didn't believe the Bible, you know what I could do probably tonight? I could go get me a job at church. I could go play in the band. I could play drums for Jesus. I could even, well, I'll start I could grow my hair back, but I probably can't do that. But I could do all that stuff. Except, it's not right. It's not right. Well, things have crept in. The devil is the god of this world. You better watch. We'll look at some biblical examples over the next few weeks and examine what the Bible has to say about being watchful. Don't you think we ought to, ought to have an ear to hear what the Spirit says? Yeah. Let's be vigilant, circumspect, faithful in carrying out our duty as watchmen in this world. You see, when, when we're not watching, the devil's been waiting. And he's, he actually, I believe, has an attribute we don't have. Patience. And he'll just wait. And when the time's right, he said, I'm, I'm watching. They're starting to slack up. They're starting to back up. I'm going to have an opening real soon. Know what the Bible says about that? Give no place to the devil. You ain't coming through here. Oh, you think you're something? Oh, no, I think my God's something. I'm going to stay awake for him one of my favorite little stories I'm done for tonight for tonight <clears throat> this young lady was in her house and the doorbell rang and she went to the door and opened the door and there stood the devil so she turned around looked back in her house and she said Jesus it's for you because that little girl's no match for the devil. And you or I are no match for the devil. I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care how long you've been reading your Bible. I don't even care how spiritual you think you are. You're no match for the devil. But the devil's no match for our God. And if we will be what God's told us to be and do what God's told us to do, the Bible says, Submit yourselves therefore to God resist the devil and he'll flee from you you have to put things in order if you'll submit yourself to God not be casual but be vigilant like he's told us to and to watch and to be circumspect and to be alert and to pay attention to what's going on around us and everything that glitters is not gold and everything that's claiming to be of Christ is not of Christ and all this religious stuff that's going on is just that it's just religion it's not a relationship with God and if we would just wake up I think one of the first things that we would notice is what's gone. Well, don't you think that would happen if the enemy came in at night? The first thing you, when you woke up, you looked around, hey, this, that's, well, what happened? Right. Then we'd see what's gone. And then after we saw that, Lord, how can we get it back? We got to get back on the post. We got to be watching again. What can you What can you bring back? 
I, I, I know time's short. But God created the whole world in six days. Don't you think God could restore the influence of the church? Don't you think he could bring revival? Don't you think he can make the difference and have the influence? Sure. The problem's never been with him. The problem's always been with us. We just have to watch. We have to do what he said. Let's pray. Lord, thank you. Uh, for the opportunity to do this. Lord, I, I know uh, well, I know I'm different. And but Lord, you know my heart. And I just want us to see what the Word of God has to say. Just help us, Lord. For I'm afraid that we are uh, we're being duped because we're not awake and, and we're being overcome and, um, yeah I know we're going to heaven and I know it's going to be wonderful that's a different part of the Bible the part that says occupy is something. the part that says watch and to be vigilant and to be circumspect that's for now because you haven't come for us yet. Lord, I pray that we'll not lay down, but that we'll stand up for Jesus. Lord, help us in this casual world to be on fire for you. <clears throat> for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Pastor. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.